Good morning. Good morning. That was beautiful. Thank you, choir and Marianne on the viola or violin? Violin. Thank you. Welcome to First Parish in Framingham. I'm Jan Miller. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as a co-chair of the Board of Assessors for the congregation along with Heather Cilio. First Parish in Framingham is a welcoming congregation. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We celebrate and welcome people of all ages, races, gender identities, sexual orientations, abilities, socioeconomic statuses, or beliefs. We welcome you here in the meeting house or on Zoom or wherever and whenever you may be watching this service in the future. Unitarian Universalism is a liberal religion that honors wisdom from many sources. We keep our minds open to the religious questions people have pondered across vast times and places. Please be sure to read the announcements in the order of service. Immediately following worship, you're invited to join us for coffee hour in Scott Hall, just across the courtyard. And speaking of announcements, Reverend Aaron has something special to share with us this morning. So I get to share the total for the auction, which is wonderful. But before I do, I want to say thank you to all of those who organized the auction, uh, all of those people who donated items, and all those people who bid on items. Let's give a round of applause to everyone. So uh, reading large numbers is never easy for me, just putting that out there. So it is the total for the, uh, the general auction is $16,344. Absolutely, I agree. And for the, pay, the, um, the raise the paddle, to help with renovations and replacing carpet over in the parish house. The total was $7,375. Oh, we have a late breaking update, Sarah Middleman. Wonderful, wonderful. So the, the math will be inaccurate for the total, uh, but the total uh, when I talked to Beth this morning was 23,719. So thank you, thank you all. Ah, good news. So now, please, please take a moment to turn your phones or other devices to their quietest settings. While beeps and buzzes can be distracting, we welcome your human noises, all of them, cooing, babbling, laughter, and all. We especially love the sound of your singing, so please join in. Since 1701, people have gathered as this community to rest or recharge to be challenged or affirmed. Those people are like you. You belong here, maybe only for the next hour, but we hope for longer. We are happy to have you with us. I now invite you to take a deep breath in and out. Continue to take a few more deep breaths and begin to release whatever you need to let go of to be more fully present to yourself, one another, and the sacred in this time and place. A flame within a chalice is a primary symbol of the Unitarian Universalist faith tradition to symbolize the light of reason, the warmth of community, 
and the flame of hope, it is our tradition to begin our worship by kindling the flame of our chalice. We light our chalice with these words from the Promise and the Practice Collection by Adrian L. H. Abraham. We kindle a flame of power, illuminating the holy in each of our faces. We recognize in the flame a passionate commitment to our shared faith. We are held and carried from day to day, week to week, in the shining of the light. This flame is mine, as well as yours. We are brought together on this day, called to growth, to expansion within its glow. What does your heart know while beholding this holy fire? Please rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 122, Sound Over All Waters. Please remain standing as we join our voices in both our sung and spoken affirmations. The lyrics are in your order of service. seated. (laughs) 
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lauren Strauss. I'm the Director of Religious Exploration here at First Parish. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I say with you all together in ASL, good morning and welcome to church. Dean. Welcome to Dinosaur Theater. <laughs> ah, hold on a sec. <gasps> Pinky, Pinky, I'm so excited. Oh, that's great, Verde. Wait, Pinky, you sound sad. Oh, it's not that important, Verde. I'd rather hear what made you excited. Okay, if you're sure. Okay, oh, yeah. guess what? The Dino Club decided what color to paint the clubhouse, and it's going to be pink, my favorite color. Oh. Wait, Pinky, you really have to tell me what's wrong. Well, I'm sad because I wanted the clubhouse to be painted green, my favorite color. Oh. Well, now I feel sad too, because you're sad, but I also feel happy because I love pink. Well, I'm still sad that it's not going to be green, but I'm also happy for you. So now, our two dinosaurs are doing a strange thing. They are feeling two different feelings at the same time, two opposite things. I would like you all to take a moment and gather into groups of four or five and spend three minutes, I'm gonna be timing it, talking about a time when you felt two opposite things at the same time and your dinosaur. <laughs> All right, group up. All right now, I don't have time to hear everybody's stories. However, I would love to hear one or two. So if you have a story you'd really like to share. Okay, then. Oh wait, hold on. I gotta push the, there we go. Is that good? Yep. Okay, so yeah, I was talking, you know, and I already knew what I was going to discuss before we even started the discussion. A lot of my friends, you know, from elementary school and from college and so many other places are moving away. They're getting married. They're having children. And I am happy for them. But at the same time, I feel sad because I'm going to miss them. And the worst part is they may actually forget about me. <laughs> Anybody else? Hi. Hi. Um, I was going to write this in the book, The Joys and Sorrows, but then this came up, so it was perfect. Um, today I'm a little sad because uh, it's exactly today, it's three months since I had to bury my boyfriend, Paul. So I'm, you know, a little sad about that. But then I think about how much I love this congregation and coming here really lifts me up and the fact that there's so many people that gave condolences and cared about me and you know cared about how I was feeling it, it really brings me a lot of joy um, so thank you everybody and I really love this congregation thank you for sharing that all right friends I have an assignment for the grown-ups I would like you to listen to Reverend Aaron's sermon today and the rest of this service. And when you get to social hour on the piano, there is a box and there are pieces of paper and markers. And I would like you to write down either something that you thought about while you were talking here or why you think we told this story this morning. 
And now it is time to sing our children and teachers and everybody else who wants to come to church school. I am Elizabeth Cavanaugh Murphy, and I use she, her pronouns. It is my pleasure to be First Parish's ministerial intern. In our community, there is great joy, and there is also great sorrow. We set aside this time because we know that joy shared is joy expanded, and sorrow shared can feel as though someone is lifting a burden. Remember, you can always share your own joys or sorrows in the, back, in the book at the back of the sanctuary or submit them online each week. As we do, we will intersperse hymn number 10, 1002, Comfort Me With Our Joys and Sorrows. We sing together to lift up our feelings, but also so that you might have a song to sing ready to go whenever you need to make your own comfort. We begin with our concerns. Eileen H. and Chris R. share with uncertainty. Chris had emergency surgery this week on his cervical spine to relieve compression on the spinal cord. He's home now, and the good news is that the symptoms of upper extremity numbness and unsteadiness with walking have already mostly resolved. Thanks to everyone for their good wishes, thoughts, and prayers, and offers to help. Let us now sing Comfort Me, verse 1, together. Reverend Aaron shares, my father's heart surgery originally scheduled for tomorrow has been postponed until additional tests and procedures can be done. We're grateful for modern medical procedures and it can also be so stressful. Carol and Bob B share, happy Mother's Day to all and especially to Mother Earth. Please consider planting native flowers like these on the chancel from Garden in the Woods. Please note too that Carol and Bob provided the chancel floral decoration today in memory of their mothers. Alma G and Sandy P write, we are so thankful for all of the cards Alma has received at St. Patrick's Manor. We can feel the love. And now we will sing the second verse. Sing with me.
As always, we light one final candle for all the joys and concerns which remain unspoken, though held deeply in our hearts. We sing now, speak for me. Let us continue now in prayerful contemplation. Spirit of life, spirit of love, divine spark. We feel your presence in the faces of those we hold most dear, whether they be treasured animal companions, new babies, old friends. We are so grateful for the joy their enduring love brings into our lives. But sadly, we also live with frustration, anger, fear, as we wrestle with the complexity and severity of the strain on our democracy and aspects of public life. We may agonize over how to react to latest news headlines, comprehending that there are no easy answers, yet longing for solutions, humility, progress, and understanding. We pray that we may bring our best selves with our righteous fury alongside our compassion and our deep love for humanity as we organize and stand up for peace and for justice. For we need one another to bring more understanding and less antagonism, more love and less hate into our world. For this is the world we have inherited and for the sake of our children and generations yet to come, we must mold it into the world we dream of. We pray for divine guidance in this, our spiritual work. And as we reflect upon the significance of this day, Mother's Day, I lift up these prayerful words written by Lisa Bovey Kemper, Circle of Care. In religious community, we share our joys and our triumphs, our sor sorrows and our broken places. In this circle of care, we make space for the complexity of life the myriad experiences that bless and break our hearts. The truth of human experience dictates that on any given day, we each come to the table with hearts in different places. It is especially so on this day, invented to honor women who nurture. In this circle of care, we honor the truth that mothering is not and never will be quantified in one single descriptor. Mothering can be elusive or infuriating, fulfilling or confusing, commonplace or triumphant. It exists in the everyday experiences of each person. There is no human being that is not connected to or disconnected from a mother. And so we honor the complexity of experience, writ large in flowered platitudes, but here in this space laid bare, honoring the truth in each of our hearts. There is room for all in this circle. If you have carried a child or children, whether or not they came to be born, we see you. If you have fervently wished to do so and circumstances of fate made it impossible, we see you. If you love children we cannot see, whether because of death or estrangement, 
we see you. If you never wanted to be a mother, we see you. If you are happy to mother other people's children as an educator, an auntie, or a foster parent, we see you. If your mother hurt you physically or emotionally, we see you. If you had no mother at all, we see you. If your mother is or was your best friend, we see you. If your gender says you are not a mother and yet you take on the role of nurturer, we see you. If you wonder whether your mothering has been enough, we see you. And if yours is a different truth altogether, we honor your unspoken story. There is room for all in this circle. May it be so today and always. We recognize the divine mystery of one another and our unique places in this world community, maintaining reverence for all that is good and abundant hope for what is still to come. I say these words and do all things for love's sake. May it be so. We'll continue with a moment of quiet contemplation. May you feel the love of this community from wherever you are. Amen. I'm the Reverend Aaron Sockel Wiseman. I use he, him pronouns, and it is my honor to serve as your senior minister. This morning, our offering will benefit our Unitarian Universalist Disaster Relief Association. Uh, I got all that mixed up our Unitarian Universalist Association's disaster relief funds. This fund is a way we make tangible our connections in our association of congregations. I asked my colleagues whose congregations have received relief from this fund to share about that experience. The history of our disaster relief funds uh, comes from August 2017. After Hurricane Harvey hit Texas, and two weeks later, Hurricane Irma hit Florida. A need for a streamlined way to make sure our people get assistance when they needed it was formed. Our disaster relief fund is a part of our covenant, a covenant between the Unitarian Universalist Association and our congregations. Between congregations who give generously and those in need and with our community partners, through aiding our congregations, their members, and their community partners, we are able to embody our faith and our values. One colleague shares this experience. When I served in Anchorage, Alaska, we experienced the 7.1 on the Richter scale uh, earthquake. The funds were immediately available to help replace equipment and other things that were ruined in the quake. It was very helpful and reassuring. Another colleague who served the congregation in Bowling Green, Kentucky, wrote that we received funds after their homes were destroyed, one home leveled in the December 2021 tornado. One family is still not back in their own home. These funds were a blessing for those families. Knowing you use donate to the disaster relief fund to help others uh, in times like this is such a beautiful expression of love and care. 
Finally, when I served in Lawrence, Kansas, one evening while I was traveling, I started to receive strange text messages, including a Facebook message from our denomination's president, so you know something must have been up, checking to see if everything was okay. And this isn't some other first person, third person writing in the first person, this is me. I soon learned that a tornado had touched down near my congregation's building. Thankfully, other than a few downed branches and the scary experience of going to tornado shelters, my congregation, its building, and its people were unscathed. However, it was a comfort to know that funding was available immediately and that it would reach us quickly. Lisa Presley, the administrator of this fund, shares these details. Between July 1st, 2022 and now, we have given out uh, $224,000 from this fund. Of that, another 107,000 was because of Hurricane Ian damage, another 1,017, um, $117,000 in other storm damage in California, Alabama, and Arkansas, and 50,000 of that went to our congregation in Birmingham, Alabama, to help our partners in Selma, which was so badly devastated by tornadoes. I invite you this morning to give generously, to support our sibling congregations in our wider denomination. I pray our congregation never needs the funds relief, but if we do, I hope others give as generously as we might today. Morning's offering will be joyfully given and gratefully received.
May we raise children who love the unloved things by Nicolette Souder. May we raise children who love the unloved things, the dandelion, the worms, and spiderlings. Children who sense the rose needs the thorn and run into rain swept days the same way they turn towards sun. And when they're grown and someone has to speak for those who have no voice, May they draw upon that wilder bond, those days of tending tender things, and be the ones. Over the last two weeks, I have learned something new about myself that comes in conflict with what I thought was a core part of my identity. The first truth is that I have known for years that I love the outdoors. I love nature. I love walking on new paths and old paths. I find comfort, connection, and a sense of reinvigoration, but also a peace in the outdoors. When I slow down and I point out the names of, or I point out the leaves that I know the names of, the oak, the maple, and the sweet gum, I feel like I am tapping into the roots of the tallest trees, the newest blooms, and the new leaves. I feel connected to the history of a piece of land. I have known this truth for a long time. This new truth that I uncovered recently after receiving a very concentrated dose of Disney theme parks is that I also love roller coasters. Hands up in the air for the whole ride, hooting and hollering, and just letting the track of this roller coaster take me where it has been designed to go. Something thrilling about the wind whipping through your hair and the excitement of it all. The inversions, the spirals, the corkscrews, the catapults, the lift hills, I love them all. They make me feel alive. So I carry two things, grounded, peaceful, centered, slow, and natural, and high speed, loud, chaotic, thrilling, and simulacra. And these two truths, at least to me, feel like they are in conflict with one another but they do not have to be. Chances are good because I know you a little bit by now. You too live with tensions in your life. Two or more truths that feel complex. How do we live with tension? How do we engage with complexity? How do we uncover a third way, which is perhaps where we have been living the whole time? Many writers over the years have said something along the lines of, how do you choose between saving the world and savoring the world? How do you live with that tension? This is one of my favorite tensions, saving or savoring the world. I think we hold both in our hands at all times. Savoring feels luxurious. It feels slowing down. It feels like recharging like a pause, like you can kick up your feet and just watch the sun and the clouds move. Saving feels a little bit more urgent, though. Life-saving. It comes from bringing someone out of sin, saving souls. It can seem essential, saving for emergency savings or retirement. Saving time on a road trip. These times it can feel routine, almost. Just hit control save on your computer to save. You, we even have auto save these days. Saving has become passive, but we know the loss when we are able to save something that we really wanted to. When an email goes missing, when a poem that we have written goes away, when we lose a loved one, a beloved pet, the environment, 
you name it. We need to reclaim saving. Bring it back from the mundane. The world is not going to auto-save itself. People don't live with this tension alone. Congregations and organizations do as well. We need to work on saving and savoring. We often wonder what is the purpose of our voluntary association that is the First Parish of Framingham. Is it to save the world or to savor the world? Are we a place to retreat from the world or a place to react to it? We have this tension, and that can be a polarity. This polarity or tension is a challenge in many of our Unitarian Universalist congregations. The thing about polarities is that they always exist. You don't actually want them to go away. We need them. It would be tough to find direction if the North and South Poles went away completely. We may never visit the Poles, but we need that tension to navigate. Sometimes we might be traveling in one direction, sometimes the other. Polarities are a series of truths that need one another. All of us encounter polarities in our own lives, two or more things that seem as though they are opposed. Folks need a job to support their families, but if they work too hard, they don't have time to spend with their families. There's one polarity. Perhaps another, as a parent, you love your children so deeply, but then sometimes they throw a tantrum, or a few years later they come back after curfew. These are all tensions. In their book, Managing Polarities in Congregations, Roy Oswald and Barry Johnson explain what they mean. Polarity is a pair of truths that are interdependent. Neither truth stands alone. They complement each other. They go on to say that congregations often find themselves in power struggles over the two polarities of, of um, two poles of a polarity. Both sides believe so strongly that they are right. People on each side assume that if they are right, then the other side must be wrong. That's either or thinking they write. Either we are right and they are right, and we know that we are right. When two people argue about the tr two truths, both sides will be right, and they will need each other to experience that whole truth. Now, the authors of this book say that while these polarities can be frustrating and exhausting to navigate, the fact that they exist and constantly and consistently pull each other is the very hallmark of a healthy congregation. With a touch of translating, they can actually be applied to any organization that you care about. From nonprofits to political organizations, businesses, departments, or schools. So they say that these are the polarities and tensions they have seen in congregations. Tradition and innovation, spiritual health and institutional health, management and leadership, strong clergy leadership and strong lay leadership, inreach and outreach, transformation and nurturing, making joining a church an easy process and making it a challenging one, and call and duty. In the center of this are each of these are our values, our core principles, the things that do not change. And they all seem sort of a little bit abstract to me. In practice, they might look like, for instance, focusing on families with children or focusing on families that are arranged differently, focusing on maintaining historic buildings or funding programs and salaries. In religious exploration, we wonder about do we go deep into talking about other world religions or do we talk about our own faith tradition? Do we focus on more contemplative worship or contemporary worship? Play hymns on the organ or with an acoustic guitar or rock band? Ministry towards those who are not yet in a congregation or work on strengthening connections inside? These are not conflicts if managed well. It is creative tension. It ebbs and it flows. Thriving congregations manage that tension well, using the tension between the two to create a synergy. Declining congregations can see it as an either or. Now each of these sides or polarities have their upsides and downsides. 
they have values and fears of what might happen if the focus is solely on the polarities. The trick is to focus on the values. What will be the positive results by focusing on a particular pole? And then, this is the tricky bit, focusing solely on the positive results. So why do we get stuck then if polarities and tensions can be helpful? I think we get stuck because at the end of the day, we are all storytellers and we are trying to write those stories of our lives and we get writer's block. Some of you write your life like a stream of conscious novel, consciousness novel. Others carefully outline everything and work on plot lines and character developments. Maybe your life story is more a collection of short stories with neat chapters or smooth transitions. And then we come to a decision point and we feel tense. We don't know which way to go. My colleague, the Reverend Jake Morrill, says that sometimes when we feel there are two or more decision points, we freeze. But the truth is that in any case where there are two, where we think there are two decision points, there are actually more like 16 different ways of going. That might feel even more overwhelming than just having two decisions. You're probably thinking, great, Aaron, I had it narrowed down to two paths, but now you've told me there are 16, forget about it. But in my mind, that feels even more freeing. I remembered his advice during my first ministry in College Station, Texas, where I served from 2015 to 2018. The state of Texas had taken the land and buildings of that congregation to build, and this is true, a new right-hand turn lane onto George Bush Boulevard for better access to a college football stadium. Can't get more Texan than that. We thankfully got a healthy settlement from the state uh, for that, and the state of Texas told us how easy a UU congregation was to deal with. They don't say that often. But we had a decision to make. The board there struggled for at least four months, but really longer. Do we search right now for a new building, for new property, or do we take some time to figure out who we are? There were factions on the board and on the sacred space team, and it felt like gridlock. We called up the uh, congregational life consultant that every congregation has and said, what should we do? And the consultant said, does your board know each other? Do they have fun together? The implicit answer to both of these was no. Okay, she said, pick a nice restaurant in town, go out to dinner as a board. Only focus on building the social relationships there. Then order dessert. When dessert is ordered, discuss the decision that you have to make and the choices that you have. And once dessert is finished, you have your decision and announce that to the congregation. And we thought, huh, that's interesting. But we did it. There was nothing to lose. So we went out to dinner, I forget where it was, but it was a nice restaurant. And we ate and we laughed and we got to know each other. Our stomachs were full. After all, how many times do we have meetings and we don't have a full stomach? And we had dessert and coffee on our way to help with our task. Oh, also I think closing time at the restaurant was quickly approaching, so we didn't, we didn't really have a lot of time in the restaurant. We discussed and a beautiful third thing emerged. We were so stuck in our tension and our binary thinking, we decided in the end to pause the property search for about three months, do some very intense mission and vision work, and armed with that new information after three months, we continued onto our property search, now knowing that wherever we were looking would help further our mission. In a time-bound, quick judgment, decision-making process with relationships fortified and good food in our bellies and 
sweets anticipated, we were able to see a third way. Both things can be true. And that reminds me of a sign that was posted out in front of an American Baptist church several years ago. It was actually uh, in front of the First Baptist Church in Newton Center. It was a sign and it had in big block letters, these letters, G-O-D-I-S-N-O-W-H-E-R-E. Depending on how you read it, it either says God is now here or it says God is nowhere. It also could say the nonsensical, God, I snow here. (laughs) That's the mysterious third thing, I guess. And a lot of folks on the internet were really upset about this sign. They said, this is why word spacing matters. (laughs) Geez, why didn't they hire a graphic designer? But it was an intentional choice. Both readings, maybe not the God I snow here one, but God is now here and God is nowhere were true. They wanted that sign to be read both ways. My friends gathered here, both things can be true. I know that I can love the outdoors and the rolling hills and the up and down of roller coasters. We can hold tension and innovation spiritual health and institutional health, management and leadership, strong clergy leadership and strong lay leadership, inreach and outreach, nurturing and transformation all together. Loving and holding two truths just means you're a well-developed character. As Whitman said, we contain multitudes. Managing polarities can be difficult, but it is ultimately life-giving. It is a sign of health. May it be so. And amen. So now let us join the choir in singing our final hymn. It's number 1014. There's a different name of it in the hymnal, in the turquoise hymnal. Um, The composer of the song, Jason Shelton, has requested that we change the lyrics uh, to reflect his own deepening understandings around ableism. So whenever you see uh, standing on the side of love, Instead, sing answering the call of love. Let us rise in body or spirit and join our voices.
with deep gratitude for all of those who made this service possible. We go out into the world. Let us take the light of love out into the world and use it to brighten our pathways. And when we need to rest or recharge, be challenged or affirmed, may that light guide us safely home. May we hold the light always, and the light hold us always. Amen, and go in peace. Thank you.